Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the NRG series here live in Indianapolis. We are giving you a Pioneer 10K. My name is Will Hall, better known on the internet as Will Hall EXP. That man to my left is the six foot two phenomenon, Mason Clark himself. And we're going to be bringing you round number seven here of this Pioneer tournament. Remember, 227 players all turned up this morning to ballot out in nine rounds of Pioneer action before we cut to that top eight and crown ourselves a champion. They're all balloting out for not just the money, the fair share of ten thousand dollars no 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 they need points they want invites invites to our end of year player of the year of the year championships where we've already got a bunch of players already qualified for it we're going to get them up on the screen mason talk me through these players and the achievements they've got they held right so roger sulman won our 2022 championship defeating jesse robkin in the finals after a stellar year there has a great year here this year as well could have honestly had a year that would have gone back to the player championship had he not requalified we'll see that in a second steven dykeman won our first weekend and has been on a tear he is our front runner for player of the year with chris smith hot on his tail then we saw daniel weissman matthew hoey Grayson, Matthew Wise, Eric Bunnett, and Kyle win events throughout the course of the year. Sort of, you know, sprinkled throughout everything. We had a team win there for Garris, for Grayson, Matthew, and Eric. Matthew Hoey, sort of a mainstay of the NRG series. You saw him come in and win with his trusty rhinos. Fun fact, Will Hall, every modern tournament that is a showdown this uh, year has been won by rhinos on the NRG series. Matthew Hoey adding to that. And we saw Daniel Weissman. Weiser, who normally crushes in other card games as well, coming on to our event and play. And then Kyle, what I call sort of the ghost winner, because it was our one energy where we weren't unfortunately able to bring you coverage from Detroit. So not known as much as known of Kyle, except that he won with Amulet and defeating, I believe, Roger Suleiman in the finals. That deck is super powerful. And if you are a fan of Modern, remember tomorrow we do have a Team Trios event. But we've got a lot of players trying to fill those slots there at the bottom. As you see, there are six invites. And that is going to be the players on our leaderboard. Let's get the leaderboard up. Let's see who is in with a chance of that. We've already got three players in orange. That means they're already qualified. But it's the ones in white that we're focusing on this weekend. Talk to me about the players that are sticking up for you here, Mason. Yeah, so only six players are going to make it of note here. So the top six players who are not already qualified will make it. So if we were to end right now, for example, Chris Smith, Will Kowalski, Benjamin Ungar, Ryan Hayes, Sarah Shing, and Fletcher Johnson would be our six players in with Cliff Boyardee just barely not making it. Listen, we saw Sarah Shearing make the finals of the first energy this year, and she's had an okay finish every single event since then, but nothing as good as that first top eight. She's been having kind of a rough day today. Maybe she'll have a clutch one tomorrow. Chris Smith has been dominating in the back half of this year, Will. He has, I believe, four NRG top eights, and that's why he has 82 points. Hasn't converted to a win, but I think it's safe to say that it would take something colossally disastrous happening for Chris to miss our championship. For Chris, it's really a matter of can he catch up to his friend and mentor, Stephen Dykeman, on the leaderboard points in order to become our player of the year and get that free entry for the following year. After that, Ryan Hayes, Fletcher Johnson, Benjamin Ungar, and Cliff Boyardee, along with Sarah Shearing, are all in a very tight race. You know, if you look at our point distribution, the difference between a top 16 and a top 64 is going to swatch somebody like Ryan Hayes and Sarah Shearing. And that's why these players are playing all these rounds this weekend and in Madison coming up in November. Yeah, as you said, every single point counts. The, at the minute, there was a three points in it if we were to stop the count right mm -hmm. now. But we believe the match is ready. We're going to move down there. Mason, I need you to tell me who the players are going to be in our feature match this round and what decks are they playing? Yeah, so on one side of the table, we have Hunter on Gruel Midrange, uh, a very popular deck. And then we have Jonathan Hobbs on your left here playing Rakdos Midrange, probably the most popular uh, deck in Pioneer, historically speaking. And Hobbs, someone we have seen do well on series events in the past in Magic. Okay, so both players off to the races with a turn on play. We see do see Hobbs on the play. Talk to me about how much of an advantage that is in this matchup when your opponent is playing things like turn one, elf, and you can fatal push it. Yeah, so in traditional magic, just in general, going first is always good. But being able to answer the elf and then develop a threat in this sort of matchup allows you to get on the board. Now, it doesn't look like Hobbs had a threat to develop, but he might have had something like a Bone Crusher Giant and was waiting to see if Hunter had anything. It looks like Hunter actually develops an unlicensed Hearst in the main deck, an unusual one. Yeah, just a one-off in the deck. We were talking about that last round about why it's in. And uh, basically, he does not like his Phoenix matchups. And this is why it's in there. It is a carbon copy of the one that did a uh, came in the top eight in the regional championships of Europe. We're going to see this Grave Tresser uh, passer come down. And I'm actually going to gobble up this elf in the graveyard. Or at least try to. Um, oh, okay. Interesting. Talk to me about this line. Why are, we doing, why are we targeting our own fatal push instead of the elf? 
Yeah, really heads up there from Hobbs. So he knows that Hunter will eat whatever he targets. So he knows that if he were to target the elf, he's definitely not going to get the life. And it's probably going to be that way for the rest of the game. But there might be a chance later on in the game where Hobbs can get the elf. So he's just doing this now in the hopes that maybe one day that unlicensed curse will be tapped and the graveyard trespasser can exile the elf. Okay, we see our love struck beast coming down the main side of it, not going on an adventure, bringing along a 1 1. This isn't the matchup for it. We want the big 5 5 body so it can block. Remember, day night is now going to be going, so both players need to be either casting spells or not for that to flip, but they are going to be keeping track of it for us. Hobbs, free mana, open, deciding how he wants to go about his turn. What are some of the big, powerful free mana spells in this deck? I mean, Fable of the Mirror Breaker is probably the strongest three-mana spell in Hobbs' deck. It's going to really allow him to curve his deck out more and do things. Bonecrusher Giants also typically find this from a matchup. Shieldred's also pretty good. There are a lot of different cards that Hobbs could play on this turn. He might even combine a double spell turn of two two drops. But it looks like he has passed the turn. I was about to say, what's, what does this say then? If we just go land goad, let, the, let it flip to, to night, which remember affects both players. The Gruel deck does play a, quite a few werewolves in their deck. So this could be a double-edged sword. Uh, I think that's a chariot coming down now, going to bring you along a bit to uh, Wolves. But what, what sort of signs is this saying on, on Hobbs' side if he's just leaving four mana open? Well, it's possible that Hobbs knew what Hunter was playing, right? Hunter had a feature match. Both these players are undefeated. They've been near each other all day. And it, he might have kept a hand that's a bit more reactive. And so he wanted to leave up his interaction, as we see a stomp there at the end of turn, mm -hmm. to uh, fight over those things and just flip his werewolf and try to catch Hunter if he tried to develop sort of another creature on the board this turn. Well, we've just had a, a new set printed in standard. Obviously, it's got the adventure mechanic on it and how uh, important those cards are to Pioneer. They're some of the, the more powerful cards we have in the format just because you have two spells in one. Bone Crusher Giant, we see, played then for a turn. Talk to me about the importance of these cards in the Pioneer format as we see a Dreadball take out that Love Struck Beast, clearing the way for this uh, Graveyard Trespasser to, to turn sideways. Mm -hmm. And we are going to see the unlicensed cards eat the creatures, so no life is going to be lost there. Yeah, so the when it comes to the adventure cards, really Bone Crusher Giant, I think, is the most impactful. Like you mentioned, they're all good, and lots of decks do play them. But Bone Crusher Giant is not only a good threat, but a good answer spell. And in a format that has fairly strong cards, but not a ton of ways to generate actual cards, uh, having a two for one built in inherently on one card is very nice. If you think about it, Fable the Mirror Breaker doesn't actually draw you cards. It converts one resource into another. So if you have things like lands in the late game, that's basically drawing a card. In the mid game though, you're really just moving one resource to another where you don't have stuff like divinations that we normally do and stuff like standard. By the way, I love that attack. Attack yes. my my two two into your four three. I definitely don't have a bone crusher in hand. Okay, you don't you take damage. Cool, I'm going to shock you to face and play a bone crusher of my own. Every mm -hmm. point counts for Hunter though. This is his game plan, right? He is doesn't want to move into the late game very much. He thinks that Hobbs is going to probably be favoring that because they have access to things like Shield Dread, which we know how much of a house that can be. He needs to get every bit of chip damage in, and I love that attack. It's a great one, especially with decks with cards in his deck like Voldaren Thrill Seeker, which will, you know, give the support ability and the ability for a creature to throw itself at Hobbs' face. That means, you know, Hobbs is sort of always at like a pseudo six is the new one, right? You can throw a Bone Crusher Giant plus two plus two, kill Hobbs out of nowhere. And so Hobbs, you know, these uh, chip attacks actually matter a lot more than they would traditionally. Okay, so seeing a little bit of body language there from Hobbs, just kind of threw the land down and went past the turn. How much do you pick up of that as a, you know, you're a coach at MTG. This is one of, one of this is your, your bag now. How, how do you teach us? What sort of signs are we picking up from on, on Hobbs' side? Is this weakness or is he just doing a bit of showmanship or just literally flooding? My general heuristic is that I assume my opponent will not be giving away information until they've shown to me a lot. And Hobbs is someone who we saw succeed at both the Pro Tour and the SCG level in the past. So I'm going to assume that it's potentially possible he is frustrated, but I'm not going to read anything into it unless he doesn't really have anything. And then maybe in game two and three, I'll be like, okay, Hobbs is willing to show his emotions a little bit. But for the default, I assume my opponents will never give me any free points. Well, here we go. Talk about some big threats in the battlefield. We're going to crew this hearse, which has managed to make its way up to a 5-5 five, five now. And this layer of the Hydra, which is going to make it into a 4-4. Four, four. Don't get me started on uh, Dungeon Dragon cards, by the way. I am a huge Dungeon Dragon nerd, and I love the lore behind all these creature lands that we see popping up in not just this format, but modern. Remember, Team Trio's Modern Tomorrow. If that is your format of choice, you need to hit that follow button and go follow the NRG series on all the different socials. Are we blocking here, or do you like just taking the hit? You know, given what I know right now, it makes a little bit of sense probably just to hold back the Goblin Shaman because you need to apply some pressure 
And, you know, we're going to need to actually fight something like this hearse down eventually. So being able to maybe combine it with a bone crusher giant next turn or something could be good or a blood tithe harvester. So you lose a lot of life now, which is bad with things like Ladaran Thrill Seeker we talked about. But you need to actually answer the problem on a long term solution. If maybe we were five, six life less, we would jump block there. I feel like Hobbs was a little bit frustrated as we did see the two lands hit the battlefield. Gets two new draws because of Fable of the Mirror Breaker, showing the power of this card. Not only does it bring along a threat, it lets you turn and burn through your deck. And then as a kicker, you do get yourself a kiki jiki creature at the end of it. But we're just going to start off with, this is a card that sometimes some lists play, some cards don't. The uh, Mystery Shadow. Talk to me about this one. And, uh, you know, with a lot of mana, this one can be pretty good. Yeah, so really quickly, I want to make a note of something. You mentioned, am I going to reinterpret what my opponent's doing? I said no, not really, until I get further evidence. Hobbs is running two lands, makes me think, okay, if Hobbs does that again, I might want to make a play that I normally don't want to make. As for Misery Shadow, this is actually a card that's really good as a tech choice against Phoenix and Monarch Green, where they have die cards that are pretty hard for the Rack to to answer. But in these matchups, you're right. Every one mana gives it plus one, plus one, meaning that the Unlicensed first, which is huge, actually can't attack in for another whole two turn cycles unless it wants to trade with the misery shadow and now Hobbs just gets to attack in with that as much as he wants and with fable the mirror breaker he can threaten two massive ones and just grow whichever one gets blocked so this was actually you know not exactly the cards Hobbs would have wanted if he could have picked any card but a card he's definitely not complaining about as a crowing war gets cast i was about to say well he decided <laughs> to not play the fable the mirror breaker in hand in favor of leaving all that mana up but kind of gets kind of uh, pretty punished for that as we can now steal it with this kind of a war coming down mutabot's going to be animated we're going to move to blocks. Oh, they get the combo. We now get to sacrifice it as well next turn. This is going to bring along a free, free beast onto the battlefield. And uh, yeah, this kind of everything's coming up. Hunter right now. Big yeah, draw step for Hobbs. The Hunter's rege Redemption, more like it. Oh my <laughs> goodness. This is uh, going to be crazy. So Fable's going to flip. And it gives us another blocker if we need it. Doesn't It's not active. Doesn't come in to play it with haste. So do you need a turn before we start copying? We've got Fable plus one unknown in hand for Hobbs on the left of your screen. He's going through all the lines. I'm at six life. There's a lot on the other side of the battlefield that's not going well for me. How can I get back out from under this? I think it might be a Bone Crusher Giant in hand. Yeah, and Bone Crusher Giant is a good way to start. You can kill that, get another blocker. Then you're, you have Fable and the token and everything. So you're not exactly dead on board, but you're right. getting really close to the abyss. Talk to me about the, the Huntsman Redemption and how this card is. It's one of the new ones from the new set. It's a free mana saga that does so much in these decks. Give it that, not only the threat element, but also kind of, it lets you play a few more one-ofs in the deck. And, you know, as the as the kicker is giving your creatures trample and plus two, plus two. Really putting this card over the edge. I think this is why it was the breakout deck in the uh, European Arsies. Yeah, you know, as we saw, you all cover out there. I think there are a couple big things that jump out to me. One, you want more good three drops to play off your eight elf starts. Two, you can sacrifice those elves in the mid game to go find an actual threat uh from your deck so you know you can go find a creature or a basic land sometimes you know you don't really want to sacrifice your elf for a basic land but you could do something like float a mana sack it grab a land play a powerful four or five drop not the most unreasonable thing i've ever seen as hobbs is going to pick up his deck and then that extra power on the late step this lets you push damage when you get board stall so it's a really nice addition to these decks and i think it gives the deck a little extra oomph in the mid games that kind of was lacking before without cards like the crowing war yeah, not only that, but you also play cards like Thrill Seeker in your deck. Go to the Free Seeker up, give your creature plus two, plus two, then play it, then fling it at their face. GG's game over. But we do have sideboards for you all. This is a closed uh, deck list tournament member, so players don't get to look at each other's deck, but we do. We're going to start off on Hobbs's side here with this Rakdos mid-range deck. We've got access to a Damson Sphere. We've got a uh, point uh, Go Blank. We've got Noxious Graph. We've got Unlicensed Hearse. We've got Duresses. We've got Consumes All, Bankbusters, volleys and uh extraction events what do you like bringing in here to show up to this matchup so go blank is a card i want to grab pretty quickly as to get a minor upgrade just going to be a good kill spell for things like love struck beast the seekers chariot etc um extinction event is a great board wipe like we talked about you got a lot of elf into three drop plays now thanks to the huntsman's redemption we're a little less all in on three drops as we might have been in the past but our deck still has a ton of them between Bone Crusher Giant, Reckless Storm Seeker, and Love Struck Beast. So we're really happy to have that card. And then in general, you know, there are a couple of different things you could do. I've seen some people bling in Reckon or Bankbuster. Actually, it's just a way to crew and trade with some of the bigger creatures and get rid of some of these discard spells and things you don't really want. I'm going to be interested to see how Hobbs wants to approach this, but I imagine we're going to see things like Thoughtseize probably leave the deck in a good number and have these interaction spells come in. 
Okay, well, over on the other side, let's uh, get this deck list up from Hunter. This is the 75 from the, the RC that we did very well in Europe. We see one copy of Gruul Charm. We've got a Hazard at the Fallen. We've got a Jagana, obviously, a companion. We've got a Coffer Sculpt of Destiny. We've got a couple of Blittering Bolts. We've got uh, a Tranquil Full Back. That's one of the new ones from the new set. Again, a second Hearse. We do have one in the main. Two Sin Divines, two Dampening Sphere, two Rending Volleys. And this is a uh, one which... I'm going to be very interested to see if it comes in. I want your opinions on it. Is this uh, Lithmatic Barrage? Doesn't really seem the matchup for it. This, you know, it says it can't be carried and it can only target, um, or it's better when it targets blue and white permanents. But mm -hmm. as a one mana does one damage to target, uh, you know, uh, a, a one one on the other side, do you like bringing this in in this matchup or, or, or not? I'm not a huge fan. You know, Hobbs' deck doesn't have any X1s in it, nor does it play that many Planeswalkers we're really worried about. Sometimes Liliana the Veil is played in these decks, but it's a card that you typically can beat up on with things like your Unlicensed Hersh or uh, those sort of spots. So I think we're going to probably skip on the Lithomantic Barrage in this matchup. Seems really good against decks like Grease Fangs and Spirits, though, and one I'm very happy to have in my sideboard. In general, though, I think Hazard the Fervent is one of the cards that's going to come in here. That card is basically unkillable, and in the early days was a Rakdos Mirror Breaker that players would go to. So I think we're going to see that. Clothis, the God of Destiny, another sort of grindy attrition-y card. We might see that come in instead of some of these um, Lanoir Elves or maybe even the Unlicensed Hearse. We saw the Hearse do some pretty good work that game, but it can be invalidated pretty easily with things like Fatal Push. I wouldn't be surprised if we just kept one in as a way to dodge Extinction Event. But that's just, you know, one way that we might see this matchup approach along with an obliterating bolt. One thing I love about these sort of decks from both these players, Will, is that you can really tailor the way you want to play the game and your approach with the way you're sideboarding. Obviously, Hunter is more copying the EUs when it comes to this sort of plan that Hobbs is, but still allows you to play the games in very different ways as Hobbs plays a Bloodstained Mire and passes turn. Yeah, so Hunter, you know, we got him in the booth last round after his win. It said that he would, he would very aggressively mold to get himself a turn one elf. And we see it here in his opening seven, so he's going to be pretty happy. We're going to see in a braid take that down, though. And I think this is kind of what he expects. That's why he's kept a hand. We have two elves. And, uh, yeah, I want to go back on that barrage play. I was completely... I don't know where my head was at. I thought it was over on the Rakto side. I, listen, I know you're used to doing with the Pro Tour and Martin Yuza, <laughs> and you're like, I'll test this Mason guy, see how good he actually is. <laughs> it's okay, Will. I understand. Now, I, I want to mention, though, I do think mulliganing towards these elves is important. As we do see a Braid as a card, you're not super hurt for a hunter to actually leave. That's a way that can kill a Seekers Chariot pretty easily. And so while you're not excited to see it kill your elf, it's not the end of the world. But actually, in general, you know, one thing that players don't do enough is mulligan towards elves when they have elf decks. And it's something I bring up in coaching all the time. I had one person who, was, who wouldn't do it. I told them I'd pay for their RCQ if they did it, and they won their RCQ that day. And they just got there. And it's just a thing where if you're going to play these elf decks, be willing to mulligan. And if you're going to play a shoulder deck, draw shoulder on four. It's very good. It, that that is a very good card to have in this pioneer format we see on the other side uh we see love struck beast going on an adventure casting the heart's desire side which you know it brings along a one one token which more important is the token on the battlefield well it got sacked to the huntsman's redemption which i'm about to say is some great deck building there from our eu friend who won here because we, we put it on oh. an adventure and then we sacrificed it to our saga that's hiding out here by the land I was, I was trying to work out. I was like, where's the 1-1 one, one gone? I can't find yeah, it. Yeah, we, we don't have the dice it. on the Huntsman. Yeah. We had the Hunters, little combo. <laughs> yeah. And then the Akron oh, War. Oh, no. It's, oh. it's, oh. It, okay, like, you know, it's easier than casting a uh, Shield Red. It's just steal your opponents. It's a lot easier that way. You know what I mean? That looks like a good big card that I can't get. For, oh, oh, hold on, wait, I'll have that. Are oh, you drawing more cards? Cool. Guess what? You can take a little bit of damage for that, which is exactly what I want to be doing. Hunter, it, look at it. Just sat back, arms crossed, like, and go. Have fun. <laughs> Yeah, a shield that's a good card, but it's like $90. That's a lot. Energy has great deals. You can get it from them. But this Akronor lets you get it for a dollar, which is also just a great deal. So, <laughs> you know, you got to love it there. And like you mentioned, Hunter's just like, yeah, you take some shielded triggers. Yeah, uh, we, don't, we don't encourage stealing here, but, you know, when it comes yeah. to shield, you can steal that across. Get that one, that one across. That's, a, that's also one of the, the, the fancy art ones that you can get of this, multiple, multiple printings of this card. I'm mm -hmm. sure NRG sell them all if you want to pick them up for yourselves. But, you know, it's not looking great for Hobbs. Like, what sort of cards does he need here to get back into this matchup? Well, it's really awkward because Extinction Events are a card you normally would be pretty happy, but if you do it on even to remove the most power, your Shieldred's also going, which is very awkward. So this might just be a turn where Hobbs was looking to get some interaction, 
maybe just something like Bone Crusher Giant to stomp the elf, deploy the Bone Crusher on the next turn. That way it dodges their Crone Wars trigger. Uh, there's a lot of different ways it can go, but Hobbs needs to basically kill everything that's not Shieldred, barely stabilize, and then build a wall behind his Shieldred proper. Well, this is going to be 12 damage if we attack with everything on board. We also have a Mutavolt Sneaky uh, hiding out there as well. This is going to be free mana coming down. Oh, we're going to have another... The amount of times we've seen Hunter oh. cast this Stormseeker in the last couple of rounds is unreal. Remember, this is the 2-3 that comes down. Gives the target creature plus 1, plus 0. Oh, but more importantly, haste and can target itself. Mutavolt getting fired up as well. So it's actually Rodillon Thrillseeker. It's very close to Stormseeker. I know that y'all oh, speak English close to us in, in, in England, but not the exact same. So that's why that shielder got plus two, plus two. But also we can fling it at Hobbs' face. So, you know, Hobbs will not get back the shielder and it's going to lose six life. So that is a huge play. And we see how this Gruul deck, in some ways, I'm starting to see some Splinter Twin situations here with the Crowing War, where it's building up all these little mini combos. That is a turn and a half. Also, by the way, the shield dread does not go to your graveyard. There you go. It does go back to your opponent's graveyard. <laughs> well, that's how you actually build your collection. <laughs> you know, slowly well, but surely. <laughs> here comes a follow-up. You know, we get another one down. Pen at the ready. Pass turn. You're going to draw a card. You can take two life. Don't miss any of that. It all adds up at the end of the day. How can we go about it on hunter side? Six points of damage needed to get across the line. Land for turn. One of the pathways. Can't right. make it. Has he got two cards in hand? He's got two in hand. He, he plays them close to the chest, and they match his uh, jacket a little bit, too. It's hard to see. Over Hunter's times... really got the Hunter's vibes in. He's camouflaging. I was about to say, how many times have you gone to a tournament and you play, your opponent's got, like, uh, I found this might be lethal, right? Uh, come across with both of these. Uh, it's close, but block. no cigar, On... I think. No, no. Yeah, you're right. Two off, right? Yeah, yeah, because we can block the Verdale and Thrill Seeker with the Shieldred. Now, if you do that, Hunter gets to sacrifice... I'm sorry, uh, Hunter can sacrifice the other one in order to deal damage to your face still, which would drop you to two. You'll gain two off your uh, children in the draw step as long as you still have children. But, you know... I think we just miss lethal, and I'm going to tell you how. I think we play the Love Struck Beast, play the Seeker, put the counters on Love Struck Beast, then we throw it to the face. I agree. I think that also would have been lethal. Check me out. I've been hanging around... Oh, the actually... Mm, sorry, you don't have enough mana, Will. You only, have, you only have six mana, and it takes one to throw the, the, the Love Struck Beast. Isn't the Seeker two? Or is it three? Oh the God, Seeker's God. three mana. Oh, yeah. I've got, that. I've got that wrong. I suck. That's why I'm going to go back to my job of just being the host. You can do the... That's why you're the expert. I just want to make you look good. That is literally yeah. my job is to make you look good, and I'm making yeah. it real good right now. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. My biological makeup made it a real good job to make me look good. So you don't have to do much heavy lifting. You can just cruise on in. And speaking of cruising in, Hunter looks to be cruising into our finals at this rate because this game is not good for Hobbs. And we talked about how normally... You know, you don't want to read too much into what players are doing. But Hobbs is down a game. There's no showmanship here. He's kind of behind on board and has his hands in his head. And he's thinking, what am I going to do to win? Well, Shield Dread's a very good way to get back into this game, right? Like, I'm all, that's probably the main way we've got of gaining life. But we do need to do more than just have the powerful 4-5 on the battlefield. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I see what's happening. So we can Extinction Event for Odd, right? That's going to... Clean the board up a little bit. Yeah, we can throw one at the face so Hop goes to three. But Hobbs is seeing that if uh, Hunter draws a land, he's just going to animate the Lair of the Hydra and attack and force the chump block on the Shieldred, which, you know, isn't the end of the world for Hobbs. It puts him in a very bad spot. But you have to do what you have to do. And it is... Okay, I see the strategy comes down. Makes it. We, we got the go wide strategy. Hobbs is going to be happy if we get another turn, draw another card, gain two more life, putting us up to five. On the cusp, are we turning the corner? We'll find out shortly. We do need to uh, apply a little bit more. Here's a... Oh, no, only one of these dies, right? Yep, one of them dies. We're yep. going to stomp one and then play the Bone Crusher as a blocker itself. We've mm -hmm. spoke about already how good the adventure is. of well, A lot of cards in this format. Kind of. Would you say these are coming some of the staples or one of the staple abilities in this format is the adventure? Because we don't have access to the powerful cards we see in Modern Legacy. Yeah, I would say when you have these lower power formats, cards that can do lots of things are really good. One other thing to keep in mind is Bone Crusher Giant is one of the best anti-aggressive cards printed in like the last six or seven years. It just always gets two bodies out of the aggressive deck, right? You stomp and kill an early thing, you play the Bone Crusher Giant, it at worst trades. That's very good. And 
inversely, it puts a lot of pressure on decks that don't do much, right? How often do you see players hold up Bone Crusher Giant to stomp a creature? The opponent doesn't have one, so they hit it at the face to play the 4-3. That's what this Rakdos Midrange Jex excels at, is oscillating between the control and the beatdown. Remember, this is a closed deck list tournament for everybody watching. Players don't have access to each other's deck list until we get to that coveted top eight. A lot of uh, you know, math working out there for Hob going, can I attack with the shielded? Can I just leave this back? How am I going to go back? It decides to turn it sideways and kind of gets a bit punished for it as we're going to steal the Bone Crusher crew come across the lethal. Yeah. GG's Hunter going 7-0, and o, doing exactly what the deck needs to do, finding that card key off the top. Congratulations to them unfortunately Hobbs drops to six and one but that's not the end of the world six and one is still a great record still live for that coming to top eight and all those points that everybody's after this weekend to get to the players championship welcome back to the booth my name is will hall that is mason clark this is round number seven out of nine in the pioneer showcase 10k that we're bringing you today if you're modern is your format well tomorrow we've got another tournament team trios all three players on modeling battling out we'll both be back for that tomorrow but we'll different partners but we're both gonna be back tomorrow so you know get sit back to my terrible english and terrible plays mason's gonna be bringing you all the kits all the correct lines and all the correct names of cards because apparently i can't do that this evening but here we are uh, i'm gonna find out if we've got a backup feature match or not uh it looks like we exactly as i say it gets told away we do have a backup feature match so we're gonna move straight down to that now uh mason who are we gonna be seeing and what decks are they gonna be playing in this feature match well, tell me if you've heard this one before. We're going to have Connor Laley on Rakdos Midrange. Connor is our player of the year last year. Made it, by the way, by one point. If you're at home and you think these points don't matter, Connor got free entry and won our player of the year by one point last year. That means one time Connor didn't drop, got his extra point, got the distance versus Boris Convoke. This is a deck we actually, I'm sorry, a matchup we saw in round one today when me and Devin were commentating it. This is a pretty fun one, Will. A lot of back and forth going on. Yeah, I was watching that one. There's no triple ornithopters going on here. Though. Let's have a little look, see what's uh, going to dress on turn one. They're like, and he's like, what, main deck? Main deck dress? What's going on here? Takes out his powerful turn two plays. So no uh, extra goblins hitting the battlefield this time. We do see Fraven and Spectre, kind of like a fan favorite. I, I personally don't get the hype behind this card, but a lot of people love the one mana one two that brings itself a clue. Yeah, and uh, you know, some people compare it to Ancestral Recall. It gives you a lot of cardboard. <laughs> I'd argue it's one of the original fire designs, but you know, that's a conversation for a different day. As Clarion Spirit was played here, and we're seeing Clarion Spirit, which is a card that has kind of fallen out of vogue in a lot of players' lists. As you saw this morning, Regal Bunnycorn has sort of come up uh, in the wake of things as being a card that can kind of stand on its own. But you know, we're, we see Andy here very well off at five and one, playing this card to great success. Yeah, both these players super live to get themselves into the top eight. Remember, this is time shifted. That's why you see it on top of your deck. Over on Connor's side, what does he need to do in these early turns? I think we're seeing it, but you know, if people just tune in, maybe they don't play a lot of modern, talk, uh, wrong, Pioneer, talking through it. Yeah, like I just mentioned last game, if you were there, Bone Crusher Giant's one of the best anti aggro cards printed in like the last five or six years that's main deckable. And Connor's doing it right now. Turn one, we used our discard spell, we broke up the combination a little bit. Turn two, we play our Bone Crusher Giant and we stop to kill something to prevent any sort of momentum building up. Turn three, we impact the battlefield in some way. Looks like this turn, Connor is going to play a Blood Tithe Harvester, maybe com combine it with another interaction spell. We see Mutable as the land for turn. That's a pretty good sign if you're Connor's opponent that there's some card he wants to use maybe uh, to do something. Otherwise, he might play something like Bone Crusher Giant to use all of his mana. As we do see, I go for the throat here on the Reckless Bushwhacker. I feel like I'm pretty ahead if my opponent's playing three mana for the for the bushwhacker and just attacking with a two one. I feel like I'm pretty far ahead in that matchup. I'm like, oh, I'll take this. But everything to play for. We've seen both these decks kind of. Now we're getting down to the gritty side of it. Which deck do you think the top decks better? So it's interesting. Connor's deck card for card is stronger than Andy's deck. Like I would take any one card at random versus Andy deck and feel very favored. However. Andy's synergies can really overwhelm him. So if we get something like Ranger Knight Captain of Eos and we're able to get two good bodies off the top of the Convoke, we might be able to come back in here. And this is why I mentioned earlier, Bunny Corn and Embercleave have really entered the deck because these games happen to you less where your opponent can pick apart your synergies. Now, you have much less explosive starts, but in the mid game here, you're still alive. And here we go. Venerate locks on off the top. A nice pickup here for Andy, giving him some staying power. He also has Gigantha. So if the game goes long, you know, and he keeps flooding out, he has some protection from that. So if you're a Colorado Lely fan, you're going to want to see something like Shieldred, Fable, the Mirror Breaker, because these bodies aren't actually going to stay larger than Andy's for forever. 
How hard is it for Connor to get this smite off the back but as it is a five mana card opposed to you know what you tend potentially see in this deck, a lot of one and twos? It's actually kind of tough. Connor used to go for the throat pretty aggressively on a reckless bushwhacker. Thought it was a little bit of a sign of strength that Connor's hand had another removal spell. Seems like it didn't. That wasn't the case. But that is one of the few ways Connor has to answer that card. Uh, besides Dreadbore, which is sometimes played, sometimes not, looks like Connor is playing one. So he has about two more clean answers to it. Otherwise, we're going to have to combine things like Blood Tithe Harvester and Blood Tokens, as we see on board. Okay, this can't be a good sign, right? If you're Andy, when your opponent starts attacking you with the uh, Bone Crusher Giant, we're mm -hmm. going to see the Graveyard Trespasser coming down. It's going to eat the Smite out of the Graveyard, gain ourselves one more life, drain Andy for one life, and then we're going to cycle away one of these blood. Get a land, uh, basic swamp into the graveyard and get a fresh look. Back over to Andy. What can we do? Yeah, this is a big turn. Andy needs to do something kind of important. If he doesn't do anything this turn, Graveyard Trespasser will transform. And then not only will it be an additional power, but an additional two draining of life when we attack. And so you see Connor here starting to attack because he knows he can't sit behind his wall of creatures for forever and just wants to apply pressure. As we see Andy use the blood to discard Gigantha and take a redraw, but doesn't find a spell. Yeah, that's pretty rough. Den of the Bugbear, one of the better creature lands that see a lot of play in these aggressive formats, but does end of the battlefield tapped. But as you said, the most important bit there is no play, which means that day turns tonight. Trespasser turns into a 4 4, but now we get double triggers. That means two life can be gained every single time we attack with this. And yeah, Connor smells a bit of blood in the water. Feels like I can get this game over with in a turn or two. Comes in the even with the Mute Vault. This is going to be a swing for 12 points of damage. That's huge. Bring Connor up to 13 and potentially Andy down to three. Yeah, and this is a great thing to take note of. If you play against this uh, Convoke deck a lot as Rakdos and maybe you're struggling locally, turning the corner is very important. Connor wasn't out of the woods when he started attacking with his Bone Crusher Giant, but he knew he needed to make this game a shorter game. He and Andy were both on low resources, and he knew that given a long enough timeline, Andy could overpower him. So he wants to make it short, even if it means he's going to maybe be at five or six life as Connor wins game number one. Yeah, congratulations to Connor going up a game. It does mean we get... We do get to have, you know, some sideboards coming up for both of these matchups. Remember, closed deck list. They don't get to look at each other's deck list, which you can traditionally see a lot now in big paper magic tournaments. But in this one, we do get to put them on the screen for you lovely people at home. So starting off on Andy's list here, Boris Convoke. How can we get one game back? He's got access to the super powerful bunny that we've seen turn up. I'm going to give Frank Carson all the credit for that one because, I, you know, he loves seeing big bunnies with Ember Cleaves and we see that, uh, how powerful that can be. Um We've got, I can't make quite make this out on my screen. Let me I got you here. Don't worry. Regain God of the Worry, Regal uh, Leosaur, Gigantha is our companion, two wedding announcements, three Thalia, Guardian of Thraben. That's a two mana one if you're at home, three Rending Volley, three Forge Devil. So this is a spot where wedding announcement is our big cyborg card. That's the one we're going to want to bring in here. That's typically your, if you're playing a white deck, that's your anti Rakdos mid range card. Um, Regal Leosaur is a card sometimes you see players playing in, typically better against decks that aren't good at interacting, so I'm not a huge fan of it myself. And Regal Bunnycorn, I kind of talked about it earlier, some players are having in the main deck because we reach these sort of end states where just keyword big is pretty good. So I'm going to imagine, even though it's just one, we're probably going to bring that in. We might also see Thalia, Guardian of Thraven come in, especially on the play, because traditionally a lot of the high-impact cards from Rectus Midrange are fairly expensive non-creature instants and sorceries. So with that being the case, Thalia is probably going to be pretty good. My guess is, is that, you know, we have a lot of uh, like extra slotted cards we don't super need. So Clarion Spirit's a card that kind of doesn't matter too much in the matchup. We could trim on a giant killer. You know, it's good against Shieldred, but maybe not everything else. You can also trim on cards like Ornithopter and go lower on your synergies to have a little bit more raw power. Probably not more than one or two, but something you can definitely do. And what once again, I think I love what this Boris Convoke deck is. You can have it where you sideboard a bunch of cards, or you can have builds like I like to play typically where you sideboard one or two cards, and that's it. And you have a bunch of different cards for a lot of different matchups. It's so cool. I love this deck. I can't get enough of it. i got a question for you. Uh, yeah. In the uh, new Modern Horizon free set that's coming out, how many cards can have the keyword big in them? <laughs> <laughs> Any spoilers? Any spoilers uh, there? I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea. <laughs> NDA, right, NDA. I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. Right. Let's go across to see what Connor's got this weekend. What's he got in his 75 and what sideboard is he going to be trying to utilize to show up this game at number two? We see dresses, consumes all, uh, bank versus that end, go blanks, uh, mystery shadows, extractions, hearse, and pippy needle. Anything here take your fancy? 
Yeah, so Extinction Event's the one that jumps out, sort of that mass board clear. So often in this deck, the odd creatures are the biggest because you have a lot of one drops that you want to play early to Convoke, and then all your Convoke creatures are five mana value. That means it's really easy to sort of use that as a cleanup material. This is part of why you saw Thalia probably come in out of the Boros Convoke deck. Um, after that, Hidetsu Consumes All is a pretty good answer. Answering all the ones and zeros, the Gleeful Demolitions can lead to these really fast starts for the Boros Convoke deck, so we might see some of those. And then, you know, that's four cards, so it's possible that Connor's going to cut things like Duras, um, Croxa, maybe trim a bit on uh, Reckoner Bankbuster. I personally really like Thought Season in this matchup. I see Boros Convoke as a combo deck, so having some amount of discard is good. You maybe want to trim one or two, though, and bring in a card like Misery Shadow that can just trade early. We saw where Hobbs, where it theoretically would have stalled the board out against Gruul. It will do a similar thing here, but the opponent doesn't have the Crow in War to take it. So those are all different ways Connor can approach playing it. I'm really excited to see how he does it because he does have things like Archfiend of Dross in this matchup, Will. which I was going to bring that, that one up. Yeah, that is a huge body where not only does it clock your opponent really quickly, but rewards us for having all these kill spells to drain them out. So it's going to be a big, big card in this matchup, I think. Well, I was about to say, I think our players are ready to go. So we're going to head down to the feature match. Game number two of round number seven. Who's going to be able to advance their record to six and one? Who is going to be dropping to five and two? We shall find out momentarily. Andy starting off with Fabian the, for Mirrors Breaker. That is obviously one of the RC promos. Um, talk to me. What was I going to was a call about main chats talking about main deck duress? Talk mm -hmm. to me about this one and what your thoughts on it. So, main deck duress is sort of a, a decision you can make, and in general, there are a lot of like uh different flex slots you can have in your Pioneer Rakdos deck. Connor might be valuing to have a little bit more game against combo decks and uh Phoenix decks, so he's choosing to have a main deck duress. It, it's typically a thing that you know. The Pioneer format is predominantly creature-based, so some players don't like doing that. However, we have seen players do that at bigger events. Typically, though, I, I prefer to metagame for those sort of things when there's a barrier to entry, like an RC invite, for example, where players are highly incentivized to win. And so, you know, we see here a Blood Tithe Harvester and the flashing of the creature. But yeah, I'm going to guess the duress is something that Connor is doing to prepare for Arclight, Phoenix, and the Lotus Field, but there are other matchups that can be pretty good in, and you know, you're just moving your percentage points around, right? He's a little better in game one against those decks, worse against other things, all about how you want to play the game. Obviously, Andy on the play, exactly where he wants to be in this format with this deck, and is able to play a load of opponents on the battlefield already. Can he sort of power out one of these powerful Convoke ones? Yes, he can. Here comes Knight of the, the Errant of Eos. Talk to me about this one. Yeah, this is the card that I think helped put the deck on the map. So Knight Air of Eos is a Convoke creature for five mana value. And for each creature you Convoke to play it, you can then add a card of increasing mana value from the top six into your hand times two. So if, for example, if you Convoke with three creatures, you can get two creatures of mana value three or greater each. Now, you do have to have it equal to the number of things you Convoke for. So, you know, we can't grab another Knight Errant of Eos here as an example because we didn't use Convoke five. So this deck now has two Convoke creatures. Between that and Venerated Loxodon, you have a lot of redundancy. Something you notice in Magic is lots of decks that are really good have this thing that sometimes people call the rule of eight, which just means you have eight of them, so you see them quite often in the early turns, especially in these things where curving out matters. So this is a card that puts a big body on the board and gives you more bodies. And we just saw Giant Killer come in and a Reckless Bushwhacker, two things that are going to cover Shieldred and Applying Pressure. So it puts Connor in a really dangerous position as Connor does cast the Thoughtseize here. Yeah, so obviously we're going to get a good look at this hand. We see uh, a wedding announcements on there. We see two um, two giant killers, one bushwhacker, and one clarion spirit. What's the one you take out of this hand? It's kind of tough because this hand, obviously wedding announcement, I mentioned during sideboarding, that's a card that we sort of bring in for this matchup and makes total sense that Connor wants to take it. Connor might have also went to take the reckless bushwhacker because reckless bushwhacker plus a giant killer uh, is a way to push a bunch of damage. Looks like Connor, though... Uh, it is uh, done thought seizing is still thinking on his turn though. He maybe wants to, yeah, has a land. I was going to say, maybe if he didn't have a land, we want to use the uh, ability of Blood Tides Harvester. He does have a stomp. So yeah, we're going to see him activate minus two, minus two on the Ranger Captain, then stomp to kill it. And now have his thing on an adventure. Shields are down, but the 4-4 body is off the battlefield. So this is one of the the, the problems for Rakdos midrange, right? Is it's very good at the one-for-one -one game. The Boris Convoke deck, they, they they make multiple little creatures. You know, if you have the Bone Crusher, a token or something, or just, I guess, one and a half yourself there, as the Bone Crusher counts as half a card in, in that yeah. in exchange. Getting off the battlefield, 
it's really going to be hard for Connor without any of the sweepers. We imagine they came in, but again, everything's different. So, sort of casting cost, what do we put it on? And we've got to take big hits like this, what we knew were coming. Bushwhacker coming down, obviously, a little bit cheaper, but again, everything haste and plus one, plus oh. So, that's going to be an attack for four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. nine, ten, dropping Connor down to seven. That's a lot. That is a lot. A lot. I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not a mathematician, but I just know that is a lot in the game magic. Yeah, I was going to say, so Connor not taking the wedding announcement might have been uh, him being like, hey, play to your hand of the board, and then I'm going to have something like Kidetsu Consumes All or Extinction Event. Now, it looks like Connor didn't actually have that card, but was maybe playing to draw it. Also, you know, wedding announcement, if the game does last six, seven turns, like it might be, it's going to probably beat him anyway. So it seems like what Connor was doing is like, hey, yeah, I'm going to take a bunch of damage from this Bushwhacker, but... If I draw Extinction Event or Hidetsu Consumes All, it's going to be a fine place to be. Also, you might notice that Goblin Shaman is Connor Mullaly there for winning a team event last year. You win one of our showdowns, you get a special token just like that. That's a good flex. It's a real, really cool flex. We're going to cycle this blood token. Uh, end of turn, I believe, while we've dropped down to two. Hoping to draw something big. Hoping to clean this battlefield up. Do we have it for Connor on his side? Are we scooping everything up and going to go to game number three? First, we're, we're going to have this fable, the Mirror Breaker. Move up to two counters. We can discard up to two cards and draw that many. I think we're mm -hmm. asking, do I know about any of the cards in your hand? We're going to discard two lands. Don't want them. Did we draw anything on connor's side not good a good look but you know you don't get your own token without being good at magic so he's going to be a thoughtful i think that's an, uh, an event in hand does that change anything odd or even does it make anything odd Blah. doesn't look it, great either way but it's a, it's, yeah. a something. it's something yeah on odds you kill three bodies and you get to keep your shaman token so that is probably the biggest part of this is that you just have a blocker now the you will be able to still push a damage, but the biggest thing going on for Connor is that that didn't the bugbears in play, so he's going to need fatal push as the cleanest answer. And another resolute reinforcement just flashing, Ooh, yeah. basically doubles the bodies here. That's going to put Connor dead, and we're going to see game number three. Yeah, he scoops it up. He's like, "Yeah, I, I don't, I, you got me." And that, and that's what I mean about the one for one removal with fatal push. There, cool, we've got you, but just adding an extra one one to the battlefield is all you need. And you know, when you have two of them double the amount so that's gonna be sick for that one but for one thing i love mason is game freeze of paper magic it's all i want i want the most amount of paper magic at high level i possibly can watch and commentate on and we're getting it here at the nrg series one little recap before we get down to game number three 227 players battling out in a 10k pioneer event today round number seven so two more rounds after this before we find out who is in that top eight is it going to be one of these players let's find out in game number three let's head down there and have a little uh Looks at Connor on the play. Close deck this tournament. Mm. Do we have opening sevens? Yeah, looks, looks like, like we've got a key for both. Yeah, and one thing to note here, we mentioned this in Hop's match as well, but play draw is very important in this matchup because just being able to answer their early pressure and then develop your threat instead of having to always be answering, right? So here, you know, Andy uh, is going to be on the draw, so his cards like Thalia might be a little less impactful than if, you know, you went turn one Voldaire and turn two Thalia. Suddenly your Fatal Push maybe has to answer the Voldaire and Epicure instead of cleaning up the Thalia proper if you want to continue curving. So big difference here, and Connor's pretty happy to be on the play for the game number three. Talk to me about this uh, Vodellion and, like, how much of a key role it plays in this matchup. It's like a rule of eight situation, right? Uh, the Voldaire and Epicure... As we do see Gleeful Demolition come on and that's gonna we're gonna stomp the other creature and still get our tokens. But this is just a, a redundancy thing for enabling Gleeful Demolition and sort of these fast starts. Uh, it's also nice with Bunny Corn, it's two bodies. So, you know, it isn't the most impactful card in the world, but when you play these aggro decks, sometimes you're just gonna be having some amount of synergy and some amount of just general, like, oh, I've gotta play something in the early turns. This is the best one for my slot. Well, here comes Legion Landing, bringing along with it a 1 1 life linking vampire. I want to talk about that play there. It kind of might go under the radar for a lot of players, but Bone Crusher Giant using Stomp in response before the creatures get in the battlefield. Why are we doing that? Because, you know, let's say that Andy has a Convoke creature. We could immediately Convoke. Now, it's possible Andy would have played Legion's Landing give us a chance to respond, but Connor didn't want to risk it because if they had had something like Venerate Locks on, it would be on the battlefield and Connor would be incredibly far behind. And again, firing off all our instant speed removals at sorcery speed here, really valuing, you know, keeping the creature count on the other side of the battlefield minimal, uh, kind of smelling that there is some sort of convoking uh, creature on the other side of the battlefield. But Andy's just not stopping. This is like, you know, we're going to play this. I'm going to get myself a clue. I'm going to bring along a spirit. That's just, we just added four power to the battlefield with just uh, free mana. Exactly what we want to be doing. 
Yeah. And, you know, if you're an Andy fan, yeah, you want to see the oh. convoke added up. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And that you see Connor scratch his head there. He's like, oh, okay, that was pretty good. I won't lie. <laughs> It's almost like your deck's doing exactly what it needs. Okay, let's before we see what's going to happen, it looks like we're going to get ourselves a, a an inspector and another uh, knight of Eos. What does Connor need here? How does he get back into this? Because it looks like on the board he is pretty far behind. I mean, extinction event was the play he needed there. If he had extinction event for even, there would have only been a one one and the knight errant left, which I know is still a lot of pressure, but. That Legion landing is going to flip, and that's going to cause some long-term problems. And that's a lot of what this board of Convex trying to do, Will. It can play a longer game. You know, it can't keep up quite as well as Rakdos, but eventually it will overpower you again. But early on, if you can get a big battlefield presence like this, push a ton of damage, you can just put your opponent in these spots where they have to be very careful for the rest of the game. And having things like Den of the Bugbear, Legion's Landing, Resolute Reinforcements, these things that create bodies out of nowhere and pressure become very hard for Rakdos to actually close the door on if they don't have Shieldred. And this is one thing I want to talk about on, on the Boas deck. They don't play removal spells, really. Besides, you know, we've got Giant Killer, but that's, that's a creature, to be honest. But they don't play removal spells. They just turn everything sideways, and you have to have the answer. I love decks that do this sort of thing. Reminds me of, like, Boss Sly back in the day. Where you mm -hmm. just, I'm turning everything side. Oh, here's a new card that we haven't uh, seen yet. Recruiter. Talk to me about this one and why this one's now seen play in this deck. Yeah, so Imiting Recruiter is nice. If you remember, Reckless Bushwhacker came in, and if it was Surge, so the second spell each turn, uh, it gave plus one, plus zero to all your creatures. It granted them all haste. This card just does that for three mana straight up. So if you're not combining with a zero mana card, it's basically the same, but doesn't need help. It also has the adventure half, which comes up rarely, but every now and again, imagine this board was empty, right? And Connor's at like seven life. Well, we can just make two, two, twos and then pass the turn and still have the Imidans. Like you mentioned before, the adventure creatures are very nice. And this is one of the new age ones. So a bunch of damage is coming through here as Karma Lily blocks with the Bone Crusher Giant and trades with the Clarion Spirit. You might be wondering why is he doing that instead of the Knight Aaron of Eos. That's the setup for Extinction Event naming Odd and cleaning up more creatures. Yeah, heads up play. I think chat's picked up on it. I do believe there should only be one blood token. I think one of them was destroyed. But here is the event. This is exactly what he needs. It's going to be... Oh, it, uh, oh it's, it's, it's not. It's, yeah, it's not, not quite. Yeah, yeah. Connor needed need to have a little bit more there. I think that situation where Connor made the block that was the best one for winning through extinction event because if he had blocked the Knight Aaron of Eos, he would have taken uh, two less damage, but there would be two more on the board. And he was like, "Well, this is the best thing to win." And he's like, "Oh wait, actually, I'm still just dead." And nothing you can really do in that spot. Connor made the trades he could make. And from what we can tell, it seems like he played his cards on curve as best he could and very heads up Lee did not play into any of the convoke creatures to give himself the max amount of time. No, and we did everything we could do on that. So like we we're killing the creatures at sorcery speed with our instant speed creatures. We we're trying to keep them down, trying to keep them at bay, knew what we needed to do. We need to get to that late game, try and get the event going, but you know, we can get there. So unfortunately, does drop to X and two. Still gives them the good shot though, getting potentially into that top 16. Might squeak into top eight if something goes really well for them, but we'll find that out in the next two rounds, ladies and gentlemen. But that is going to be it for our games. But we do have some future events coming up and the NRG series. And obviously that means we get to go for Will Facts and one of the next events we've got coming up is in uh madison i believe which means i'm going to go to my phone i'm going to get up my facts but while i do that i'm going to tell you that is happening on november 25th and 26th that is the weekend after thanksgiving i believe if mm -hmm. my uh, uh american knowledge is, is up to date where on saturday we'll be having a 10k modern showdown and locking one more player into that end of year championship event and then on the sunday there's a 5k pioneer trial if you you know really want to start and start battling out because we're getting close to RC uh, for America. I believe yours is in December. I say yours yeah. Like so, you know, yeah, December 14th. It's a crazy time. Pretty big gap there. Okay, let's get to my uh, Will Facts for Mason. Where have we got here? We got um, the sea has a thriving craft beer scene. So, you know, if you're into your craft beer, maybe you want to go to Madison, get yourself into you know, playing a bit of modern. If it doesn't go your way, you can go out and you can, uh, sample all the local beers and uh, kind of drown, you, you, drown your... Uh, your sorrows that way. Uh, another fact about the sea is it has been the host of the CrossFit Games annually. So, you know, the absolute opposite end of the spectrum there. If you're really into your fitness and seeing some of the fittest people on earth, you can get yourself to the CrossFit Games and uh, potentially see all the big stadiums and everything that's going on that way. But that is Will Facts for uh, the uh, beautiful city of Manson. So we're going to head back 
to the booth. We do have a lot on the line this weekend, men and ladies and gentlemen. It's not just our beautiful faces that you get to see in between games and us talking about the beautiful game of Magic the Gathering that you see. They are battling out for prizes this weekend. There's a lot on the line. $10,000. The winner gets to walk away with two point four thousand dollars as well as the, tr the trophy but more importantly the invite and those extra 30 points to hit get themselves up on the leaderboard then prizes go all the way or money goes all the way down to 30 second and points go all the way down so everybody that turns up gets one point but realistically they want to get as many points as possible we are all aware that there's only three points in it if we stop the count right now between the the sixth and seventh there's three points in it let's have a little look see if we can get up on the screen how everybody's doing in the points race this season mason talks about the players that are sticking out for you yeah once again here i'm really interested in sort of the players that are live for end of the year championship now one of the cool things about here in the energy series is that we reward consistent results over the course of the year now the pro tour is great but you kind of have to spike an event or do really well there so they have a similar system to us once you're actually there but getting there is the hard part here, if you want to get to our Players' Championship, you might not actually win one of our showdowns, but if you come to our events and you say, listen, I'm really good, I can play all the events, or you know, do play enough of them and consistently do well, I will make it. And we see players like Chris Smith doing that. Chris Smith has, I believe, four top eights this, season, uh, this year and is doing really well, hasn't closed the door, but if the uh, series were to end today, this was the last event, Chris Smith would be in to our Players' Championship, which is a $25,000 prize pool it's gonna be an awesome event we stream it every single year it's so much fun we can't wait to show you that on january 6th and 7th of 2024 now obviously all of those players are people that are saying that to me ryan hayes is someone that we've seen play on other circuits come into our scene here on energy series and do pretty well he's got a respectable position right now isn't locked up and has a lot of people biting on his heels sarah sharing and fletcher johnson cliff boyardi and even sean gallery here on the other side are all within striking range if ryan hayes doesn't put up some good results this weekend and in Madison over in late November. Now, I want to also point out there are some really strong players over here that are not quite on our exactly spot here, but can easily go back to back top eights between these two weekends and then being in range. The biggest example of this is Theodore Jung. He is actually Connor Mullally's teammate from that token we saw before. Theo is a great player, always doing incredibly well. Won a PTQ in Vegas and is sort of in striking range and does very well in both Pioneer and Modern. So this weekend and next uh, uh, event in Madison are great spots for Theo to maybe jump and sneak into the last spot here. You know, he's only about 12 points behind from actually being invited to the event. So easily in striking range if Sarah and Fletcher slip up. Yeah, it's like a you know like a, a sports leaderboard, isn't it? Like the late one in the season we get, it's really where every single point counts and then get the nitty gritty and you get to see who makes it and who doesn't. But we do already have a bunch of players that are qualified for this end season that we will be seeing. Let's see if we can get them up on the screen before we head to a break because uh, I've got them there. We are on here. Talk me through all these players. Uh, just give me a quick rundown. Who here is the real standout for you so far this season? I mean, so Roger Suleiman. I, it's hard not to say him. Not only is he our champion from last year, as you saw on the leaderboard a second ago, his name's in orange because he has the invite from winning last one. But even if he hadn't and he had lost in the finals, he just would be back again at this rate and is putting up a pretty good results this weekend so far. So Roger Suleiman is sort of one of the people in the NRG series that consistently performed and show what tight technical play can do. And if I had to pick someone from this year, it's got to be Steven Dykeman. He is our front runner right now for player of the year this year. One back-to-back -back opens. Uh, like one on Saturday, one on Sunday. That's two series events. Those are huge open tournaments. It's insane that he won back to back. It's so hard to flex. do. It's a big yes. Flex. Stephen Dykeman has also top eight in more events since then. So no doubt that he is someone that you have to also nod your hat to. Sweet. Well, that is going to be our plays and that, but that is going to be it for round number seven, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to step away. We're going to have a short break and then we'll be back right with you with round number eight here at the NRG series. See you all shortly. <laughs> 